1 Chronicles chapter 12 and James chapter 1. There are two passages I want you to turn to. 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and James chapter 1. Now these two passages point out the importance of knowledge of uh, what we hear from the Word of God. A lot of times we come to church and we hear good preaching. Our hearts get stirred. And then not only that, we know about it. Even as we walk through this wicked world, we know the truth. We know some answers and good tips that can help us to overcome obstacles throughout our day. However, the problem with people today is in spite of knowing the Word, opening their hearts to the Word, listening to the Word, hearing the Word of God, they don't do. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and we'll read verse 32. This is talking about David's mighty men as they were hiding out in the wilderness with King David. And I notice one particular tribe is mentioned as follows in verse 32. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Now notice right here that the children of Issachar, Unlike the other tribes that are mentioned, the Bible says these men had understanding of the times. We are in a very special time, undoubtedly, with all the nonsense going around, the New World Order building up, and apostasy growing, and then churches falling away and apostatizing. We have understanding of the times. We are grateful, we are thankful, or you should be, for being in a Bible-believing church. As our brother Jesse had prayed, we're very thankful for the church that we have. Why? Because unlike all other churches, we are very unique. We are very special. Not because we are. It's because we're doing something different that other churches aren't doing. And they would do it. If they did it too, they'd be like us. It's simply understanding of the times. We have Bible believing. We have Bible believing truth. Amen. That's a clear difference. We know the King James Bible is the perfect, pure word of God. We know dispensationalism, so it prevents us from falling into wrong doctrine. And because of a perfect word of God, we can study it more. We can trust in it. We can delve deeper into it. Find great doctrines from that book. Unspeakable treasures. And that book has power to speak to us and we can hear it and believe it and know it that it's true. But it's sad that we don't do it. Ooh. And that's the sad thing nowadays is that we're supposed to be Bible believers. We ought to know better, but we don't do them. If you look at James chapter 1 and verse 22, a famous passage. But be what? Doers of the word and not hearers only. Why? Deceiving your own selves. Are you lying to yourself today as you, dro as you drove more than an hour, many minutes to come to this church, to sit down and hear the Word of God, sacrifice your valuable time, and then put money on the offering plate so that you can hear the Word of God today. Are you lying to yourself right now as you do all these things? Are you lying to yourself as you sing the hymns along with us? Are you lying to yourself when you come down on the altar and get right with the Lord? Are you lying to yourself as you hear this preaching right now? Why? Because none of that matters if you don't do anything. Mm, that's good. You can sing a thousand thongs, songs in this church. It's not going to do anything good if you don't do something about it yourself. You can listen to a thousand sermons from me, but it won't amount to anything if you don't do something about it yourself. You can write all the notes and then draw all the charts perfectly to a T with the Bible teachings and understand every right doctrine. Right. But guess what? You know what's so sad is that you might know all the right doctrines more than the false churches out there, more than lost people out there, but they do more than you do. And it doesn't make a difference. And that shows that their good works for the devil, their good works are better than your good works for the Lord. Then what's the point of all this? Do you see 
the importance of doing something about coming to church. It's not a tradition. It's not a family thing. It's not a social circle. Because if you came here for that, there are tons of churches that are better than us. That are better than us in doing that. Why did you come to this church? To hear, believe, and know something that you can actually apply in your life. And then you'll see a change in your personal life, a change in your home, a change even in your workplace and the people around you. Amen. Amen. Do you really sit, carry that power, that change with you so you can live a happy life? So that you can live a life full of certainty and faith? A life filled with strength, overcoming any trial that comes along yeah. your path? Or do you not carry that with you? The children of Issachar did because they had the understanding of the times. They realized, hey, I'm willing to leave Saul's kingdom and become a runaway with King David and hide out in the cave and wander in the wilderness and go through it. Just go through the trials. Just fight it out. Just be a good soldier of the cross just to help out King David. They actually did something because they know. The world nowadays, because they're starting to opening their eyes of current events of what's going on, it's because of that knowledge they started to finally do something about it. But you know what's sad is that us Bible-believing Christians, we knew about this a long time ago, and we don't do anything about it. The title of my message today is, Be Ye Doers, Not Knowers of the Word. Let's pray. Father God, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. This is a church filled with so much knowledge of Bible-believing truth. We are too blessed, Father. This is a church of knowers. But God, we lack doers. Lord, may there be more doers than knowers in this church today. But even better than that, may there be knowers and doers of the Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Look at Romans 2 and James 4. We're going to turn to a lot of passages today. All right? So follow along with me. We're going to go to Romans chapter 2 and James chapter 4. Again, it's James chapter 4 and Romans chapter 2. Now, do you realize this? That, yes, you came to church... Yes, you heard the Word of God. Yes, your heart is open to the Bible. And the, you're hearing the King James Bible. And you're hearing right doctrine. And your heart is soft. And you're even saying amen. And you're even coming on the altar to get right with the Lord. Shed your tears on this altar. And you repent. And then you have a heart that's so receptive. You believe the Word. You hear the word, you're open to the word. There's no stubborn heart in there. There's no sin or hindrance. You're just open to the word of God. You're just a fresh fish out of water. You're just ready to eat up the hook where Jesus Christ is reeling you in. You're just waiting to go inside his ship and be in there all the way. But guess what? When you go back to your seat after altar call and then you drive back home, you're still no different the next day on Monday compared to the last week of Monday. There is no difference. Yes, you heard a preaching of the Word of God that hit the very issue that you had. The exact sin problem that you had. That gave you the answer, the exact answer that you were looking for. Some of you have been praying about the sermon, praying to the Lord, and then the preaching was exactly what you prayed for. Like right to a T. And you got it exactly at that amount. And guess what? Monday, you're no different from last week of Monday. What's the point? Yeah. I want you to come to church. And I know that the church is like a hospital for sick people. So sometimes we have to encourage yeah. the feeble-minded, right? The babes in Christ, help them to grow more and, yeah. and, and let the Holy Spirit deal with them. They can do more things. I understand that. But guess what? You are wasting your time coming to this church if you think that, hey, I can come to church and that's it. No, when you come to church and then you do nothing about it in your life, you just wasted your time. You might as well go out into the world over there. For the babes in Christ, the feeble-minded, 
The reason why we encourage you to come to church, we comfort you and help you is why? So that we can pray and hope the Lord can do some change in you and you can naturally grow in the Lord. So when you're naturally growing, what does that mean? You're doing something about it. Yeah. Amen. But if there's no doing... And God's a very patient God and he's gentle. He's been that way with me and he will do it with you. And he expects us to do that for all of you as well. We will do that. And that's the point. But God don't waste his gentleness, his patience and his prayers. Neither should you with this church. The patience, prayers, the gentleness, the love and all that is so that is there going to be a change out of you? You know why? Then what's the point of coming? If you're going to always say, no, I'm not going to do anything about it. If that's your mindset, then you already made your decision. You're wasting your time. Go to the bar. Go to the clubs. And live out in sin. Because you're no more different compared to that open heart coming to the altar, getting right with the Lord. But you still repeat the same thing. Wow, that's good. Look at Romans 2, verse 13. The Bible says right here, for not the hearers of the law are just before God. How about that? Did you, hear, did you read that? You're not just. You're not right with God just for, hey, I sat through pastor's sermon. whoop de doo Yeah, I, points for me. Yeah, I did something. No, no, no. That's not when you're right with God. It's not when you hear the preaching. You, you come to church and hear the preaching. It's not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the what? Doers of the law shall be justified. I can tell you tons of Bible-believing Christians out there who don't have a Bible-believing church to go to, who don't have technology like you do so that they can hear Bible-believing teaching and preaching, and they're doing more for the Lord in persecuted communist countries than you are. That's good preaching. You got everything here. You got Bible-believers, Bible-believing preachers. You got a blowout, a montage of that. You got a hymn and an extra hymn with new songs that you never learned about before. You got people who love you, who pray for you, and who are patient with you. You got a pastor who tries to preach conviction to change you and a teaching that you'll never go hungry. And yet, what are you going to do about it? You're not right with God. No, you're not right with God if you just take all this in and then you go back home and you do nothing about it. You wasted your time coming to church today. James chapter 4 verse 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, right? I know dispensationalism. I know how to get saved. I know right doctrine. I know what I should be doing to uh, have a better life for myself. And doeth it not, to him it is what? Sin. Sin. Good job that you know dispensationalism. What are you going to do about it? Good job you know right doctrine. What are you going to do about it? Good job that you've heard some gleanings from the Word of God that helped you. Now, what are you going to do about it? Let it sink and swim in your, in your mind and in your heart and it just feels fluffy and just feels good. And Yes, that's good. Yes, that's good. It's an invisible nothing that's swimming in here and then just disappears and poof! Does nothing for you. You got to do something about it. Amen. Amen. If there's something that's good for you, you got to use it. You got to do something about it. Not just let it swim and give you fluffy feelings. And then you come to the pastor and say, man, that was great. Co preaching pastor with that conviction, conviction swimming in your heart. And oh, that feels good. That's wonderful. And yeah, I needed that. And then it just disappears at Monday. Yeah. What good is that then? All I did was make you feel good today. Yeah. You know what you came to church for? To feel good. That's all you came to church for. How about that? You wasted your time today. You know, what's the difference with the person who went on the altar and then commits the same sin at Monday that any lost person is doing? What's the difference? He's a Bible believer. Yeah. Because he knows more truth than the other person. But he's still doing the same action as a lost person. What makes them different? That's sad. The person who knows more is the more guilty one. Yeah. Wow. 
Why? To, much, to whom much is given, much is required. What? There's got to be doing out of it. If there's a person who doesn't know a hurricane is coming and stays in the city and then drowns out, that person is, no, that person is less accountable. That, don't, that person don't receive the blame compared to this person who knows a hurricane is coming and yet still insists to stay in the city. Who's the greater idiot? The guy who knew and yet didn't evacuate. Who's the greater idiot today? Not that atheist who cussed out Jesus' name, bitter and angry at God and don't believe it. The greater idiot is the Bible believer who knows God is real, who knows arguments against atheism, who knows dispensationalism and right doctrine, and yet acts like just the same sin as that atheist. Wow. That's the greater idiot. Look at 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings 2. So you have to understand this. My first point is the motivated action. Motivated action. The reason why you're not acting out what you hear and know from the Word of God is because you don't realize it's sin. You don't realize that when you fail to act it out and do something for the Lord that it is sin. Do you understand that? Didn't you realize that, you know what's sad? 90% of the people who came to church today, which is going to be sad, 90% of you who came to church today will sin against God as soon as church is over. What do I mean by that? The very act of you coming to church and hearing the word of God and doing nothing about it, do you realize what you did was sin? Do you realize that as you are driving to, heading toward church today, that you are about to commit sin? What sin? Going to church to hear the word of God and do nothing. That's called sin. Didn't you know that? You thought it was a good job. Oh, good for me. You know, I hear the word of God. I've done my part. Yip, yip, uh, yahoo, etc. So then you think like that. No, you just sinned that day. Why? Because, uh, don't look at me like a tree full of owls. owls. Did you read James 4? Therefore, to him that knoweth, knoweth to do good, which you all heard now, right? But doeth it what? Not. To him it is what? Sin. Have your argument with God, not me. All you onlineers subscribe to our channel, watching us, and etc. and all that. Yeah, you heard all this good stuff, and Man, thank God for Bible-believing truth. Guess what? As soon as you press that subscribe button, that like button, that view button, and kept listening and watching us, you just sinned against God because you did nothing about it after that. What good is hearing all that, watching all that, seeing all of that, if you don't do anything about it? God don't give you dispensational truth so that you can just have it inside and that's it. No, He expects something out of it. Yes, sir. Look at 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. You know what will motivate you to action if you realize you've sinned today? How many of you realize you've sinned today? I've just sinned coming to church to hear it and then just repeating the same thing. If you realize that, they'll motivate you to do more. If you say, I'm coming to church so that I can do something tomorrow, Monday. So that I can exactly hear what I need to hear in the teaching and preaching. And I'm going to actually do something about it as soon as I go home. Do you do that? You don't do that, do you? If you don't do that, you're sinning. But if you have that intention in mind, then you're doing the right thing coming to church. You came here so that you can hear something, know something, so that you can use that outwardly when you go home. Now... Are you going to do something about You know what will motivate you to action? If you think like that. If you realize, I have sinned. That's the first step with any right thing to do for the Lord, is to be humble and realize, I have sinned, Father. I repent. Forgive me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. If you realize what you've done is sin, it will motivate you finally to do something about it. Amen. But some of you have lived in ignorance and didn't realize you've sinned today. 
1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9. Now therefore hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. So notice that David gives instructions to his son Solomon that he knows, Solomon and his sons know what he should do to punish a certain soldier. And Solomon, he did it. He was the wisest man who ever lived, and he did it. He chose the right punishment to punish a soldier that caused problems and burdens throughout King David's life. But what made Solomon do it when he knew about it? So notice right here, verse 9, Solomon knew what to do, and he did it, right? Well, what would make him do it then? What would make him do it? You guys know, but you don't do anything about it, right? What's the difference with us and Solomon? Because it says, knowest what thou, what? Oughtest to do. Because Solomon knew this is not an option. This is not, hey, I'm too busy with work excuse. Hey, I have a health excuse. Or, hey, I have this problem excuse. Or, hey, the temptation and sin is too great. Or, hey, I have a family history. No, he wasn't thinking like these are options and excuses can give you an opt-out to do it. He said, this is what I have to do. There's no other way around it. I must do this no matter what. You know what you would do? I'll tell you how you can act out if you really take this sermon as this is something I must do. Then you'll act it out. Yeah. But no, you don't. You just came here so that you can feel something fuzzy or something convict you and, oh, yeah, stab me in the heart, Pastor, with the preaching, you know. Oh, yeah, that feels good, you know. And then you go back home. What, are, what kind of weird feeling is that? What are you, man? You want to get stabbed in the heart all the time and that's why you come to church? What a weirdo you are. Amen. You want to be stabbed in the heart. Why? To break that stubbornness that's holding you back from amen. doing something for the Lord. Triple amen. Do you take Sunday as a sermon that this is just an option? This is something I don't need to do. Do you really think that way? You know why all of you work in jobs? Why you kids go to school? Simple. I have to. It's not like, well, I have an excuse and, well, I have a family history and, well, I just can't do this. No, 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 no. You just go, I have to and I got to go. And it's like uh, you wake up in the morning, brush your teeth and you do it. And you do it. You just do it because it's a have to. Why? Because it's a have to. You recognize that. But you don't think that of the Word of God. That's strange. You think that a physical job, physical food, physical money, physical education, you don't do that with the spiritual, eternal words of God. Isn't that strange? You never take this as a have-to option. I have to. You know why I go to church? Sure, I love the fellowship. And I love all of you. I know I joke around that I just want to be free from you, you know, but I really do love all of you and I want to minister to you. It felt great just preaching at all of you last week. It was just a wonderful thing. But you know what? I have many days I don't want to go to church. No matter how funny Robert Randall is and I want to hear his jokes, guess what? There are days I just don't want to go to church. There are just days I don't want to go to church. But guess what? You know why I still go? I'm thinking, I have to. That's right. That's good. You know why I read the Bible and pray? Not because I want to or feel so. No, I have to. Amen. I have to. Amen. Do you think that way? When you go so many? I have to. Amen. I must. I need to. Must. There is no choice. No other choice right here. I must do it. 1 Samuel chapter 25. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 25. You know why you don't do things for the Lord? You don't think that you have to do them. That's your problem. You think that it's just an option. It's just something good to hear and something you agree with, something you believe in, something you know about, and that's it. That's all you think about the words of God. That's all you think about Bible-believing truth. That's all you think about a Bible-believing church. It's just something I should know and believe wholeheartedly. That's why I'm a Bible believer. I believe the truth and all that. That's all you're good for, huh? And you don't do anything about it. 
What good is believing and hearing if you don't do anything about it? Look at 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 17. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Now, this servant is asking, uh, is telling Abigail <coughs> that her household is in danger, that King David will wipe them out because of what her husband did wrong. So then the servant says to Abigail, make sure that... Uh, you, uh, let's see, I lost the passage, sorry. Okay, so he says right here, know and consider what thou wilt do. So Abigail, she did something to save her household because she knew the danger that was coming from King David's men and the wrong her husband did. She did something about it. All right, why was she able to do something about what she knew? But we Christians don't do anything about what we know. You know why? Because there's something right here in that passage. Notice right here that it says, Now therefore know and what? Consider what thou wilt do. You know what your problem is here today? You know from the preaching on what to do, but you don't consider. When you know the truth, do you take time to consider, to reflect, to pray? To let us sink in the heart and show you your weaknesses, what you need to work on. Do you truly take time to consider and look at yourself? Am I doing what's right for the Lord? Why is it that I keep repeating the same pattern no matter how many sermons that I've heard? What is in this preaching that I've heard that would really help me do something? Not just help me, but do something about it. What is it about the sermon that will help me do something about it? Do you take time to consider? Because a lot of times, the preacher can't tell you everything the Holy Spirit needs to tell you. Yeah. I can only give a base. And then you and God alone is where the Holy Spirit is going to tell you more. Amen. Amen. But you don't do that. That's why you don't come on the altar. That's why you don't take time to pray on your seats. You don't consider. You don't consider on Lord... This is my weakness. This is what I need to work on. Help me. Lord, there's something I don't understand. Will you guide me? Do you take time to pray and consider? Do you take time to consider what you've done wrong? You know, what's important now, this message, if there's something that kicked your sin, something that uh, encouraged you to do something that's right, you have to stop and consider. You have to plan. Do you actually even, do you even have a plan when you go home? What you're going to do? Do you even have a battle tactic how to conquer the sin? No, you just let it swim in your head and it just dis disappears like that. What good is hearing the Bible a thousand times and hearing great preaching a thousand times if you still are going to commit zero action. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. We're going to look at Ezekiel 36 and then we'll read verse 36. Ezekiel chapter 36 and then we'll read verse 36. What would motivate you to do action? Well, you have to recognize you've sinned. That's the most important step, right? I reckon I've done wrong, all right? If you recognize that and you recognize what you're doing is sin, then you'll start to do something about it if you realize what you're doing wrong. The second thing is you realize it's something you have to do. It's not an option. It's not like, well, because of this reason, that reason, that... No, no, no. It's like I, I must do it. I have to. A third thing is if you take time to consider, like seriously ponder, pray, plan out something, you know, reflect, talk to the Lord. Like don't have peace about it, fast and pray to the Lord until you have something with the Lord. Like you consider it so that you can have a guarantee that you will do it after that. When you know something from the Word of God, you got to consider to a point that you know it's a guarantee you're going to do it. Do you go that far? And then another thing is, if you commit your word to it, then you'll do it. Look at Ezekiel 36, 36, even the great Almighty does. 
Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have what? Spoken it. So when he speaks something, God's going to say, I'm not going to do it, right? And I what? Will do it. You know why? Because God is not a liar. When God puts something in his word, in his book, he has to keep it no matter what. You know that? That's why God didn't blow up the world yet, yeah. the Bay Area yet. You know, he commit his oath in his word already that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. He put his word to it, so he's going to keep it. That's why he's going to do it. You know, you never had that in your mind. You, you, you know, when's the last time when you woke up in the morning that you said, I'm going to read the Bible and pray? When did you ever said that out loud before? Did you ever do that before? No, you just went by the feelings of the flesh, kept the mouth closed, and you didn't do anything about it. You just say, when it comes, when it comes, and I'll do it. If it don't come, then don't come, and I don't do it. No, why don't you have the guts and the courage to say, even when the flesh says, ah, Bible reading and prayer is going to be skipped, and it's so hard. No, no, have the guts to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to read my Bible and pray, Lord. What if, I break, uh, what if I break it? Then you break it, you repent, and then do it again. You're not doing like a foolish vow or something, but it'd be more helpful if you put your word to it. Yes. Isn't there something that you made a promise to somebody before, and then later on in life you regret it? Oh, I don't want to do it, but I have to because I already put my word to it. What makes you do things, even if you don't want to do it, is when you put your word to it. You know what motivate you to do action? You just say, I love you, Jesus, so I'm going to prove my love for you today by trying to win that soul to Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord God, Amen. Lord God, I hate this sin so much, and I'm going to prove it to you by not doing that sin today. Amen. Amen. Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to read first thing in the morning. Oh, brush the teeth, go to work. See, that's that have-to option that you're thinking about the world. You have to have a have-to option on doing something spiritual Amen. for the Lord. Like, I got to pray. I got to read the Bible. Good. That's got to be in your mind. Amen. Like clockwork. Amen. Of course, I'm not saying in a legalistic manner, in a machinery manner, God's not going to bless it. But let's be honest, the flesh will feel like a machine. If there's something spirit, if you have something in there that this is the right thing to do, I made a choice to do that. I want to do what's right. Even if the flesh feels so heavy and doesn't want to do it, as long as there's something small inside you, that's okay. Then drag that fleshly machine of yours and then just read the Bible and pray. Amen, and don't feel guilty about it either, huh? Amen, preacher. Put your word to it. Look at Proverbs chapter 20 and Matthew 7. We'll look at Proverbs 20. And then we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7. My second point is more action. My second point is more action. It's one thing that you're motivated to act out, to do something for the Lord. But you know what the sad thing with people nowadays are? Is that they think that they've done enough for the Lord. Some of you right now are thinking, yeah, I'm a doer of the Word. I've done enough for the Lord. Did you really truly do enough for the Lord, you think? Are you really a doer of the word, or you just think so? Well, let's look at Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 11. The Bible says, even a child is known by his doings. Did you see that? It's other people who know, not the child himself, but other people know his actions, his doings, which proves whether his work be pure and whether it be right. Now look at Matthew 7. Matthew 7 and verse 20. Wherefore, verse 20, wherefore by their fruits, see their actions, their deeds, their fruits, ye shall know them. You think you're a doer of the word, but let me ask you this question. Do others know that you're a doer of the word. See, you think that, yeah, I don't have temper issues. Yeah, I don't have 
uh, worry, fear issues. Yeah, you know, I am loving as a Christian. You know, I don't have hateful uh, intentions in my heart. And yeah, you might think that way, but do others see you that way? That fruit of yours do not come out unless others see it. How about that, huh? How about that? Amen. People know if you prayed enough. People will know that you're a very spiritual person. People will know that you've been winning souls, and you don't even have to parade it or say it. People just know. Praise the Lord. You know why? Because if you actually did it, that fruit will have to reveal and show itself. People know. Praise the Lord. People know. But if people don't know that about you, then are you truly a Christian who's avoiding sin? Are you truly a patient Christian? Are you truly a loving Christian? Are you truly a non-compromising, stand-your-ground Christian? Are you truly an anti-worldly, anti-sin Christian? Do people know that about you? Or they see you no different from them? You know if you're a doer, if other people know. I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about what you think. Oh, yeah, I did enough for the Lord. No, 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 not you. Do others know? If, you, if others don't know, then you need to have more action, more doing out of your life. There's something that you're probably backsliding on. Look at Philemon 21. <clears throat> Philemon 21. Do they know that our church, a Bible-believing church, that they actually do take soul winning seriously? That they actually love people and pray for them? That this is a church that's non-compromising? Do they really know that about this church truly? If others have been saying that about us and know that about us, great. You know why? Because we did it. But if they can't say that about, the, uh, about this church, then there's something we're sliding, aren't we? But let's not cover those. What about areas of sin, right? Your weaknesses, faithfulness, forgetfulness, neglect, consistency, strength, no whining, no complaining. Can they truly say that about this church? Can they say that about you? You? then you need to have more action out of your life. You're not doing what you think to be enough. Look at Philemon 21. The Bible says, Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing, look at this, this is great, this is a testimony, knowing that thou wilt also do what? More than I say. You know what would be a blessing is that, you know, the Lord tells us, read the Bible, pray, go to church, win souls, stay away from sin. It's that simple, right? Yeah. By doing those things, we naturally grow and find more specific sacrifices and callings that the Lord will guide us to. Amen. So it's a simple statement that the Lord gives, but why is it that the Lord would say something and we do it? Why can't we do more than that? Because He did more for us. Right. I mean, Jesus Christ, he saved our souls from hell. That should be more than enough. Yeah. But you know, he gave you and I eternal security, yeah. sanctification, Lord. justification, redemption, Amen. a home in heaven, and Amen. everything. Thank you, Lord. He gave more for us. Why can't we give more wow. for him? Good. You know... Just because, yep, I volunteer for kitchen duty, I put my name onto it. Let, it's not just that. Why can't there be more than that? Not just, yeah, I came to soul winning that day, that day, at the supposed times that we should be doing soul winning. No, why can't we do more than that? Yeah, you know, I got your prayer request, I wrote them down, and I prayed for you. No, why can't it be more than just the request asked for? But you pray more specific things for them. Oh, yeah, I've read through three chapters of my Bible today, so I'll go through it a year. What? No, why not more than that? Why not more than what God asked you? Because isn't He worthy of it? Doesn't He deserve it? 
you think you're doing enough, but you're not that spiritual. None of us are, not even I myself. Look at Romans 1, Romans 1. I want you to go to Romans 1, and then the second place to go to Mark 12. I want you to go to Mark 12, and then I also want you to go to Romans <coughs> chapter 1. My third point is motionless action. Motionless action. We're supposed to act out, do things for the Lord, but it does no bit of good if it has no motion, if there's no actual action out of it, no movement out of it. And that's unfortunately a lot of people today is that they have motionless action. They're not willing or not being able to actually do it. If you look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 28, I would like to ask you, is this you? Is this you in Romans 1, 28? And even as they did not like to what? Retain God in their knowledge and gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, did you read that right there? Did you read that right there? If you're the type of person that says, well, pastor, you know, I know all this kind of stuff, but I just don't want to do them. You know what the Lord's going to do? Eventually, it's going to turn to a point where you won't even know. You know that? There are people who know all the Bible-believing truth, but they fail to do it for the Lord. And what's going to happen is God's going to go reverse. He's going to say, okay, if you're going to keep doing those bad things, I'm going to take away your knowledge then. Yeah. You know that's sad? Imagine our Sean Lawler lost all that knowledge in his head. You know, that's gold, brother, you know, in that head. That's a lot of honey there. But imagine God took, but imagine God took all that away from him. Because Christians have kept failing to do the right thing for the Lord, and then God took away all that knowledge. Yeah. That stuff, I've seen it. Don't tell me it don't happen. I've seen it. I've seen it with Bible believers. They know the consequence of sin. They know dispensationalism. They know the, all the arguments of proof there is a God. They know all of that. But because they failed to do something about it, God took away their knowledge. And then the next time you saw them, you were shocked. They're like, why is there a God? Why is there suffering? Why, why do you preach that way? Why do you teach that way? And you're like, what happened to you? I'll tell you what happened. Because you kept doing the wrong things. And God took away your knowledge. Yeah, that happens. Yes. Amen. You don't want to be that person. If you're that type of person that, well, I ain't going to do anything about it, then guess what? Then God will give you what you want. If you insist in doing the wrong things, God will make you know the wrong things. And He'll take away all that Truth, that gold mine, the gem, the wonderful knowledge that Christians in persecuted countries don't have, that, but you have. Yeah. I mean, we got Bible believers before us, especially when Peter Ruckman combined Lark and Schofield and everybody all together. Man, what a wealth of knowledge. But gone. Gone. Why? Because you're not going to do anything about it. And God says, okay, if you insist on doing the sin, I'll make you know sin more than the Bible-believing truth. Give me back the truth that I gave to you. That truth that costed people's lives. Brother Sean knows how long it took for him to find the truth. Imagine all that a waste. God help us. Amen, brother. All that pain you sacrificed to get that knowledge and you finally got it and you're here today and then it's gone just like that. God takes it away from you. Wow. Like that. That's true. Is that what you want in your life? No. Is that what you want in your life? You need to, you know what that verse says in Romans chapter 1? Verse 28, retain. They did not like to what? Retain God in their knowledge. That's why you keep doing it. You don't want to hold on to that. Yeah. You try sinning when you know it's wrong to do the sin. You try going after the world when you know it's wrong to go after the world. No, no, I know what you do. You drown it out. You ignore it. 
You try to pay attention to the doing the sin, doing the world, doing the flesh, rather than knowing the truth. Because it's hard to think about Jesus dying for your sins and saying, I love you, when you take a swig like this. That's good. See, you don't retain that. When you do the sin, you automatically reject it and say, God, I don't want it. Yeah. You know what you need? You need to let God retain it for you. You know what you need to do, some of you? you if I were you, I'd pray to the Lord and say, God, let me retain it. Make it hard for me to commit sin. Make it hard for me to skip church. Make it hard and miserable for me to skip Bible reading and prayer. Make it hard for me to skip soul winning. Lord, retain that conviction fresh in my mind and let me remember that preacher who was spitting at me and pointing his bony finger at me and carrying up a King James Bible and said, you need to get right with God. Amen. 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 Look at Mark 12 and verse 24. Mark 12 and verse 24. The Bible says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God. You know why these people do errors, do wrong things? They don't know the Bible. They don't know the power of God. It's very simple why you have no action out of your life. You don't truly understand the power of God or the value of that book. You just come because it is. People who, who, who searched for truth very hard, they know the value of this book. Right. They know the value of the power of God. Right. That singing in the blowout, you know, it's weirded out at the beginning, but then you understand, wow, the true power and the value behind it. Yeah, church attendance, you know, we fellowship together. It's just a meal. Yeah, whatever. No, no, no. no. People who've been searching for that know the value of it. People who've been by themselves as a Bible believer, who starve and hunger for fellowship, finally found it. They know the value of it. When you taste, I've seen it happen where people who attend a revival meeting, summer camp, blowout, and etc., once they tasted it, they've done something about yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. You know why you don't do anything about it? You don't taste it. Greater, greater yet, you deliberately miss out the opportunity to taste it. Do you know what I mean? Jelly bean? <laughs> That's what Dr. Ottman would say. <laughs> but see, until you, until you taste it, there's something you can do something about it, right? When you taste that street preaching with a fellow comrade next to you who's preaching, and then you get amped up, you can't help but do the street preaching. Yeah. Why, you've tasted the power of God. The value of brethren the value of bonds, the value of loving each other, praying for each other, and the value of that precious book against a God-forsaken, God wicked, hell-bound world. You understand the value of that scripture and the power of God. Amen. You know why it's hard for me to get back into the world and into the flesh and all that kind of stuff? It's hard to give up the ministry, even though there are the dark sides of me that want to forsake it. You know why it's hard to do that? I've tasted too much of that power of God. I know what it's like even on a bad day when I come on this pulpit and preach. I've tasted too much of that power. I'm so much drunk on power that I can't drop that bottle called the Holy Amen. Spirit. Amen, Pastor. But it's easy for you to sin because you, you don't taste it. You deliberately don't want to taste it because you're afraid, aren't you? You're afraid of that power. That will convict you. That will change you. That will transform you. You're deliberately dropping it. That's why there's no action out of your life. Let's close it with John 13. John 13 and John 10. John chapter 13. And then we'll close it with John 10. Uh, for time's sake, I'm just going to read it, all right, because we don't have time. But John chapter 13, verse 7, it says this. Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Uh, there are those of you who will not know and nor understand what I'm preaching about. I don't get it. That's okay. You know, you may not know it like how I know it, or I know a lot of people here right now are knowing it. 
We know this truth, the truth behind this sermon, and that what we need to do, and the power of God, and we know the taste, but you don't. That's okay, you may not know it, but guess what? You will know later. You will know later. One day, God will show it to you, and it will become as plain as day. And then the sad thing is, you're going to go, why did I know it a long time ago? I guarantee you this. You say, I'll never know it. No, I promise you this. You will know it. One way or the other, God will make you know. God will make you know the truth. Make you know the power of God. Make you know conviction. Make you know the truth. Make you know that, hey, what the preacher said is true. I need to do something about it. At the first, I found it disagreeable, too strong, too offensive, and etc. But I didn't understand that at the beginning. But now I know. Why didn't I do it a long time ago, you're going to say. You will say that one day. God, I pray that it will be now rather than years later when it's too late and you have to reap the consequences of your sin. John chapter 10 and verse 38 says, But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. If you still have a hard time knowing, I know it could be difficult. But there's one thing that I ask you to know. Can you at least acknowledge, recognize, and know the fruits of how God blessed our church? You've been here. You witnessed it. Can you recognize that there were people who had broken homes yet were repaired? People whose health had been shattered, but the Lord has healed and gave them a better purpose in life? People who are struggling with money financially, yet God gave them a better future. People who were hardcore into the most extreme that they will never get into Bible-believing truth, yet they somehow transformed and became Bible-believing. Sure. Can you witness and at least acknowledge that they've got something I don't have? They are happy with what they have, and I'm not. What they have is real to them, happy to them. I at least can acknowledge that. Can you acknowledge with this preacher here who is at odds, single, very young, started at 21, in the Bay Area, rent will be stinking expensive, I'm at a total disadvantage, and who'd want to listen to a Korean who's 21 years old? What kind of different nationalities, cultures will come? What kind of people will come who are older than me? People who have families and who are married and I'm not. Who's going to listen to this kid? And where I had, how am I going to make a living? How am I going to survive? You've seen me now. Yeah. All I can tell you is this is a miracle. The place that I'm at is a miracle. This one that I have is a miracle. Yeah. And you right here today is a miracle, is a proof of a miracle to me. Amen. And then the online ministry, how we've won, thousands of souls saved. You can't deny, you cannot deny what I have is real and true and less, nothing less than short of a miracle. Can you at least know that and believe that? If you can't know and believe what I preach to you. You know why I have all this, the fruits, and why some of these people have all that? Because we know, we believe, and we did it. We did it. That's the difference with us and you. If you would join us today, you can know. Will you taste and see that the Lord is good? Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open.